destined to be a lawyer, Richard? Was this I think family members and stuff like that? No, no. Uh, I had a great grandfather who I never knew, who was a lawyer, uh, and uh, ultimately a failed lawyer. He left my grandfather with a, a lot of debts, which my granddad paid off. Um, but I didn't know him. Yeah. Somewhere there is a eighth grade booklet, which included, among other things, everybody saying what they wanted to be. Right. And I, and that said, I was going to be a lawyer. So at the age of whatever I was then, 12 or 13, I pretty much knew where I was going. Where was hometown for you? I was brought up uh, on Lake Champlain, up in the North Country, on the uh, edge of the Adirondacks. And uh, what at the time was a little village called Port Henry. And it was a port for the iron ore. We, the principal industry there was deep shaft iron ore mining mm -hmm. and the secondary industry was paper, pulp paper. And they shipped things in and out on barges. Um, the mines themselves were about four miles away. Um, and my dad worked for Republic Steel, which owned the mines. His father worked for one of the paper companies mm -hmm. as a machinist. So we were involved in both those, those industries. At the time, it was a thriving community. Um, I was born before the war at the end of the Depression. And once the war was over, it was just gangbusters. I, everybody was working. Uh, everybody made a decent living. The gap from the richest to the poorest was not terribly large. Every, uh, money was different back then. It, it just, things were manageable. Uh, and the town ran very well, right up until about the time I was in the middle of college. And then the bottom dropped out. So you graduated when, what year? 57. So you graduated in? Right, well, high school. High school, yeah. 57. 57. And then, uh, where'd you go to college? Uh, Rochester, University of Rochester. Now, as part of that, what was your major? Uh, I guess I finished up with a major in English with a minor in history. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and then law school. No question you were going to law school at that point at all? Uh, I would say for freshman, sophomore, junior year, there was a lot of question as to what I was going to do. <laughs> I mean, it, it was nip and tuck between uh, <laughs> digging ditches and graduating. Mm -hmm. And somewhere uh, just before I turned 20, I woke up and turned things around. I was very young when I went to college from a very small town, and I was nowhere near ready. Yeah. You graduated from Rochester, and then off where? To where? Cornell. Cornell. Cornell Law. Was there a professor or two who sort of, you look back now, modeled you a little bit as to what you might end up doing? I don't, I don't know if anybody modeled me. Uh, there were, I thought, excellent professors there. Um, our criminal law professor was a former district attorney named David Curtis. Uh, we had a, a constitutional law professor named Rudy Schlesinger who was just brilliant. He was a, a Jewish professor who had escaped from maybe Austria or Germany before the worst happened over there and came to this country, I guess had to sort of recertify himself. Uh, and he was one of the professors everybody really was very aware of from at Cornell at that time. Uh, John McDonald wrote the CPLR essentially. He was chairman of the Law Revision Commission that wrote the CPLR. A lot of good professors there. Uh, I've, Sure, I've left some out. Um, Were there clinics, things that gave you an opportunity during law school to do practical work? Well, the only I think the only practical work that I did was in my second year. Uh, Burke Marshall came up to Cornell and 
gave a couple of lectures, lectured to a seminar that I was taking, and in, recruited for the civil rights program. There was an organization called, a, I think I've got this right, the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law, which was a product of the Justice Department, but it was sponsored by the American Bar Association, and some of us started working on that, doing research. Um, so there was a little bit of that. There was a legal aid program at Cornell, but I wasn't, I didn't quite make the cut for that. They took the second 10. First 10 went to law review, the second 10 went to legal aid. I spent most of my time there somewhere between 21 and 27. Yeah. So just under the, under the wire. So Burke Marshall, no small guy. I mean, in the big scheme of oh, no, Kennedy's no, administration. No, he, he was not a, he was not a big person physically, yeah, but yeah. he was he was the guy. He turned, I believe, uh, Bobby Kennedy around, and mm -hmm. um, so you know, uh, no, he was interested. I mean, we I sat at a table but across from him, we, where you are. Yeah, uh, we got people from time to time, they would bring them in. I'm sure they did other places as well. Uh, usually they would give a lecture to a large first year class and then to some some of the smaller uh, second and third year seminars. When did you from Cornell, did you know what you wanted to do thereafter? I knew I wanted to try cases. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't sure how to go about that. I graduated in 64 and that was a tough year to find work. It got a whole lot easier about two years later when the uh, Vietnam War kicked in and, mm -hmm. and young men were being channeled in different direction. So I spent um, several months just going back and forth across New York State interviewing various places. Um, I stayed at Ithaca for the first half of the summer to study for the bar. And I, because I grew up and was a, still a resident up in Essex County, I took the bar in the third department. Mm -hmm. And the benefit of that was there were very few of us in the third department, uh, mostly some from New York City, mo the guys from Albany. But we were processed and admitted within, I think, two weeks of the results. Oh, wow. I, was, I was sworn in, I think it was November 11th. And I got the results, uh, well, 26 years ago this week. Yeah, um, in the New York Times. Hmm? In the New York Times. I actually got them in the Herald Tribune. Oh, really? Okay. Uh, my, my dad had been transferred to Cleveland while I was in college. And I was going back and forth. My grandparents still lived up in the old house. And I was just going back and forth between Port Henry and Ithaca and Cleveland and hitting Rochester, Buffalo, Binghamton, New York City, Albany. Uh, I got a job offer from one of the large New York City firms that I was weighing. I really didn't want to take it. They told me I'd spend two years in the back room before they let me go do anything. And New York City was a pretty tough place economically. Uh, so I came back from the being admitted. And in, at Ithaca, there was a posting of a, a position in a, a personal, what they described as a personal injury firm. It turned out to be a captive uh, legal department for the Kemper Insurance Company. Mm. And that was in Buffalo. And uh, I stopped off and met the two-man office. And the, the older lawyer, the senior lawyer there was a man named Frank Malone who was a, just a wonderful man. Excellent trial lawyer. And I wound up there for about three years. Mm -hmm. And through that, representing the insurance defense work, does, is that sort of how you found your way down here? Uh, 
Yes, what happened was Kemper decided that they would close that office. Uh, and they shipped me down here because there was a complicated merger between a little life and health insurance company here in Jamestown and the Kemper Group, which was a huge mm -hmm. insurance conglomerate. Uh, Empire State Mutual Life Insurance Company. I, I don't know if you were here while they were still... Yeah, Larry, was that Larry Kunkel? That was Larry Kunkel. Uh, a man uh, by the name of Bill Fletcher, who was their president, had passed away uh, earlier than they expected. Uh, Morgan Doolittle was the chairman of the board, and he felt they needed some executive help, and so they entered into this very complicated association of two mutual insurance companies who don't have stock, they're owned by the policyholders, and, and they brought in Larry Kunkel to be the president, uh, a fellow named uh, Arnie Rheingold to, from New York City to be the uh, salesman, uh, vice president in charge of sales, uh, and I came down to be corporate counsel from Buffalo. And that, and at the same time, uh, I got married. Big days. <laughs> uh, so I moved. I moved down here. Stayed at the Y. Found an apartment. Got married in August. Patricia came. We honeymooned uh, over Labor Day weekend, and she got a job teaching. I think first or second grade. Well, at least you did a honeymoon at the YMCA. No, no, no. We, and, we, and we found a, a wonderful apartment in a, a two, large two-family house uh, owned by George, uh, Joe and Mary Brookler. Mm -hmm. And Mary was just this wonderful, motherly uh, Italian lady who would come up with a plan, a pan of lasagna or <laughs> You know, just uh, just looked after us, uh, and I, a couple of weeks ago, I had some free time. I was waiting for my car to be fixed, and I walked down Sixth Street to that building. Hardly recognized it, yeah, <laughs> and thought, "Gee, we were here right up to the time our first daughter was born." Yeah, but we had we. Had very good times there, and, and it was it was very different coming from Buffalo after three years in uh, that practice to come to Jamestown. So you would have been in Jamestown. Uh, let's see, do, do, doing the math here, late sixties. Uh, July sixty-seven, I came. Patricia came first of September. So and you're, so you're your general counsel of uh, what is essential empire being. Uh, merged in, in with sorts with Kemper. How did the Jamestown Bar uh, uh, receive you? You're a guy from Buffalo. You're you're a Buffalo defense account defense counsel. The the time I spent working for uh, Empire as an employee, yeah. I really wasn't very much involved in the bar. Yeah. Uh, I was there and back and forth to Chicago and New York City mostly handling the various aspects of this merger and some of the work that uh, just cropped up in the course of the insurance business. Uh, after whatever it was, two and a half years I guess, it became pretty apparent that once the merger was completely out of the way, there wasn't going to be much work there. Mm -hmm. Howard Crosley, uh, who was a, at the time a uh, pretty prominent Jamestown lawyer and certainly a very well-known individual, uh, was on the board. And he encouraged me to come down to the Fenton building, start my own practice, sure. which uh, my wife was working as a school teacher and we decided that we could probably live on her salary for a year or so while I got things going. The Fenton building was owned by a number of lawyers and they, at the time, did not have any young guy over there. 
And they said, well, if you come here, we'll give you free rent for a while and we'll send you all the work we don't want to do. Which meant night court and family court and landlord tenant stuff, just the cats and dogs kind of things. Uh, and I got a $600 raise in April or something like that. And the treasurer of the company came over and he gave it to me as if it was a million dollars. Mm -hmm. And I sat down and figured out just where I was going to be 20 years from now at $600 a year. <laughs> and decided I needed to make a change. I, I had a friend here in town, a, a lawyer who's now passed away named Jeff Weesey. Uh, and uh, Jeff told me how much money he was making, which was seemed to me like an awful lot of money, although it was, in Jeff's case, always about three or four thousand dollars less than he was spending. And I figured I ought to be able to do just as well. So I opened an office down there first of September. And about the 15th of September, Patricia walked through the door and said, I'm pregnant. <laughs> and that was the end of the teacher's salary. Yeah. <laughs> so between September and December, I made a thousand dollars. But then it was good from then on. So Ed, you're in the Fenton building. You're brought in there at the encouragement of Howard Crosley. Howard, well known, um, uh, a, a character. Yeah. It is oh. a character. Howard was on the stage at Little Theater, and that, that and in the courtroom was where he was the happiest. That's Give me your best Howard Crosley story. My best? Oh, God, I don't know. Uh, Howard and I went to New York City, and I can't tell you if this was before or after I went down to the Fenton, uh, to the Fenton building, but we had to go down there for Empire. Uh, and we had a meeting with uh, an attorney who later became the Commissioner of Insurance for New York State. We get down there, we go to dinner, we've got the meeting the next morning. I checked into the hotel, Howard checked into the hotel, we had the adjoining rooms. He said, I'll see you in time for the meeting tomorrow. I get up next morning, Howard's not in his room go down to the restaurant. I was sitting at the table in the restaurant wearing exactly the same clothes I left him in. Never went to bed. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Never went to bed the whole time. We had our meeting and then we had to go down to the immigration department because he had made the acquaintance over the evening of an Italian opera singer, a man who he told me had a wonderful tenor voice, uh, but was having some trouble with a visa, and Howard had volunteered to, and I don't know if Howard knew anything about immigration law or not, but he had volunteered to straighten out this fellow's visa problem so that he could stay in the United States and sing at the Met or wherever he was, and we spent more time straightening out the immigration problem for the, for the, Italian opera singer than we did on the insurance business for Empire. <laughs> and I don't know if he ever slept. Yeah. Uh, well, so, so many of you, well, everybody's got stories about Howard. It's always good to uh, negotiate with Howard prior to lunch. Yeah, and that, and that was a problem. But that was a problem that I think is very common particularly with trial lawyers. When I was in Buffalo, uh, I was there three years, and uh, Friday afternoon, the trial bar would gather at the Hotel Lafayette. Uh, and you'd, if you were a young lawyer, you'd go there and just sit and listen. And the old guys would tell stories, and sometimes you'd pick something up. But there's an awful lot of drinking. Yeah. And an awful lot of fellows, uh, there was a lawyer that I used to have a relationship with because he sometimes handled overflow work for Kemper, 
that we couldn't handle in the, in the captive office. And he had to keep his hands in his pockets when he was in court because they would shake so much. Mm. Good lawyer. Good lawyer. But, uh, so you were down at the Fenton building. Uh, probably a, a good pause. Uh, I'm going to show you a composite. And there were a number of lawyers who not only owned the building but were tenants there at the Fenton. And if you have any, any, any recollections uh, at the time, because you were there when well, Price... Well, you, you, they were by floor. Yeah. You, you had uh, Price, uh, Price, Price and Miller. Price and Walter Miller, Miller was there yeah. uh, with uh, Sam and Charlie Price. And this was before Bill Evans got there, before Tom Flowers got there. Mm -hmm. uh, and, of course, before the younger Prices showed up. Uh, they were still playing gorilla ball up at Chautauqua. Uh, let's see, the Wrights were there. And the Wrights were all Cornell. Mm -hmm. Al McKee was down on the second floor. Okay. Remember Al McKee? I do. And, and Al was a, an, another excellent trial lawyer. Uh, strictly uh, civil law. Mm. I don't think he ever had anything to do with criminal law, but he was an outstanding trial lawyer uh, and a Cornell grad. Tubi Scarpino was there, and Tubi was, the, the bar was chock full of people who were, could have been subjects for Mark Twain or Dickens, and <laughs> Tubi was pretty close to the top of that list. Um, the Alessis mm -hmm. were on our floor. Uh, the Alessis and Howard Crosley were shirt tail kin. Uh, D. Lawrence Carlson, who was Howard's uncle, and Sam Alessi Sr. had married sisters. Oh, yeah, yeah. So you had, and I didn't know Sam Alessi. He was either gone before I got here or he died shortly after I got here. I never met him. But D. Lawrence was still there and in his 80s. Uh, I don't know if he was actually practicing, but he came in every day and he went to lunch every day. Yeah. Uh, he, he may have just referred people over to Howard. Yeah. Uh, but we had Sam and Bob Alessi next door. Mm -hmm. And we had a, a telephone system that uh, all of the secretaries were on. So that the, the Alessi's secretary and Howard's secretaries and my secretary uh, could all answer the phone. So if somebody wanted to go to lunch or had to go run an errand, somebody else would pick up. Right. Uh, and we shared libraries, which is to say I shared their library. I didn't have one. Right. Uh, and we always broke for coffee at about 10.30 if you weren't in court. And everybody gathered over in Howard's big office, which looked out onto uh, the corner of, of uh, Second and Main. Right. Uh, and had a little conference, <laughs> so that was that was a, a nice arrangement. Right. The Alessis were, you know, very very good people, very friendly, very welcoming. I all of the lawyers, almost without exception, who were older than I was, were very willing to take young lawyers under their wing and help them out uh, with business and with advice. Uh, and I, I don't know if that goes on now or not, but you had just a catalog of, of mentors. Uh, Howard was, was there all the time, of course, but people like Bill Arison, uh, Lee Town before he went on the bench. Uh, the, when I got, there was real hierarchy. When I got here, the, the older top men, the legends, were Willie Cass Sr. and Mike Lombardo. Uh, and they were both, Mike was quite old at that point. Willard wasn't quite as old, but his health wasn't good. Uh, and then you had the next generation, of Art Bailey and Howard Crosley and Bill Arison, Lee Town Adams, those guys that were in their late 40s, early 50s, mm -hmm. Al McKee, on the civil side. Bob Daly, mm -hmm. 
uh, and it, it, it just uh, it was a very comfortable place. The bar here was very, I found them to be very welcoming. Buffalo was tough. Uh, a lot of competition. The, the, the lawyers weren't unfriendly, but the adversarial nature of things up there was a lot sharper than it was down here. The pace was much slower down here. Everybody kind of took their time and enjoyed life. We used to have a, a practice of taking, what was it, Wednesday afternoon off. Yeah. The bar, yeah. the bar closed every Wednesday afternoon. Yeah. Uh, if you needed to close a real estate deal or get divorced, you're going to have to do it on Tuesday or on Thursday. I remember that. Uh, but didn't that was part of the banks at that time, too, also took Wednesday afternoons off? Well, and of course, all of the banks were owned and, and run by local people. Yeah. And every bank had its, uh, the lawyers that worked, did the bank's work. Sometimes they were relatives of, a, of an officer in the bank. Something. But it was a very friendly, fraternal, I suppose kind of inbred uh, situation. Uh, it, it, I'm, I, there's no doubt in my mind that lawyers today here in Chautauqua County work much longer hours, work much harder than they used to. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I worked very short hours once I got things going. Yeah. I used to spend six hours a week at the gym. Um, I'd go up to the Y and play basketball for two hours at lunchtime. Yeah. Uh, and you, during this time, uh, you probably gravitated more towards the litigators and did you find that's what you were principally doing, litigation-related matters? I was doing the kind of things that somebody like Al McKee or the Wrights just didn't want to handle. They didn't want to go to night court uh, out in Busti or Falconer. Down it would come to me. Uh, and that was, that was its own world. Oh, yeah. And it, it, again, it, in its own way, it was very pleasant. My, oldest daughter tells me that she kind of resented the fact that I was gone a lot of nights. But I have to say that chasing around on that circuit with guys who for the most part are no longer around was a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, we had a number of judges and a few regular police officers and a very congenial assistant district attorney and the defense bar and everybody just enjoyed themselves. You go to Ed Jackson's court or you know, Art uh, Thomas's court out in North Harmony uh, or whoever was sitting in Ellery. Gordy, can't remember his last name. Um, now, it's gone. Take Did care you of you. You'd take care of your business and then everybody would adjourn to some establishment and I didn't stay as late as some of them did, but they were full full evenings. So during that time period, who were the, the, the DA, who was, and the assistant DA normally is the guy who got the night courts, who were some of the names, name some names? Well, the, the assistant DA was Bob Seidel. Okay, Bob did most of it, yeah. Oh, yeah. and Bob was a, 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 just a good guy. He was a classmate of Willard Cass's and Lucian Ledestro's. Uh, I'm trying to think what the Judge Cass used to call him. He had a nickname from Albany Law School, yeah. which was associated with the, his ability to drink an entire bottle of beer without stopping. <laughs> what, and I, I can't remember what it was. Um, you know, football player, sure. big hearty guy, and very friendly, and, and just very congenial. Um, Mr. Sinclairville. Yep, I'm sure he was. Douglas uh, knew him as, my partner Douglas Spoto knew him primarily as a, a very good real estate lawyer. And I know when we had the uh, memorial for Bob, he, he said all you guys talked about was his work as an assistant DA. Why didn't you talk about what a good real estate lawyer he was? But uh, 
you start to learn something about uh, criminal law in the justice courts and the city courts, and eventually you graduate to bigger things. And you did so, and at some point you became uh, in the public defender, and before that probably assistant public defender. How did you work your way into the public part of this? Well, uh, I got to a point, we, we, the court was still appointing lawyers to serious cases in some, in some matters. So the first several good-sized cases I got, I was appointed to by, by Judge Adams. Uh, as uh, as uh, independent counsel, independent from the DA's office, uh, I, I picked up a um, home invasion, burglary, armed robbery case. And I think that's the first big one I got. Mm -hmm. uh, there were three men who broke into a home up in somewhere near Forestville, and there was a shooting and. The public defender got the worst of them, and somebody else got one, and I got the least culpable of the three. Um, and then we had a incident over in Allen Park, which came to be known as the Allen Park Riot, mm. which was largely uh, racially related. Uh, police were called and they made a number of arrests which by some strange coincidence happened to be all African Americans. And most of those people arrested were charged with assaulting police officers. And those cases got distributed out. Bill Arison got some, Dalton got, Dalton Burgett got at least one, Lynn Hartley got one or two, I got two. And those were felonies, those were second degree assault cases. And they, and they were kind of, uh, you know, they were, you had something at risk there, okay. young people. As it happened, it, all the arrests were made after the fact. They, people weren't arrested at the scene. And the police tried to identify later on who it was that was uh, they confronted and it, at least in the cases that Bill Arison and I worked pretty closely together because our cases kind of dovetailed. Uh, and that's when I really got to know him. And he, was a, he helped me a good deal with those cases. This, I think, was maybe in 72 or thereabouts, okay. something like that. And there was a lot going on there, a lot of newspaper coverage, a lot of, of um, argument back and forth. Uh, we had protesters from uh, the Fredonia area, outside the courthouse. Uh, so they were, they were kind of high profile cases. And you know, you had somebody who was, one of, one of my clients was a college student and one was a high school student. And they're looking at, uh, you know, state time. So they weren't anything to fool with. And I tried one of those against Park Catchpole and the other one against my classmate, Charlie Loveland, ah. who was an assistant DA at the time. So you had to take them one at a time? Oh yes, they were all tried separately, the ones that were tried. Now Bill Ayers, I, I don't know, to be honest, if Lynn and Dalton tried theirs or if they settled them. They were, the, this thing was chaotic. And it just happened that Bill's cases and mine occurred together, you know, involved uh, the same general incident in the same part of the park. So Bill uh, at the time was the public defender? He was the public defender and he had two of those cases that I know of. He might have had three, but I know of two. And in those four cases, uh, they'd gotten the wrong person. They just identified the wrong person, went out and arrested them. Um, is that how Bill sort of got to see how you in action? And is that Bill? Had you been an assistant? Oh no, 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 no! I was just one of the guys. One practicing down here, yep. uh, doing you know, occasionally getting some real estate. Uh, more frequently, family court, yep. divorces, and low-end criminal stuff. So how did you finally uh, get into under uh, as an assistant public defender? 
Well, I never was an assistant. Okay. Well, I take that back. I was for a year before I retired. Uh, in 1975, uh, my friend Jeff Weesey called me up and said he had a friend named Paul King, mm -hmm. who was an assistant district attorney and who wanted to run for the office of district attorney. Mm -hmm. I knew Paul. In fact, I'd been cross-examined by him once because my office was burglarized, mm -hmm. and they caught a fellow with my checkbook down at one of the car dealerships on Washington Street trying to buy a car <laughs> claiming to be me. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, <laughs> and the car dealer knew who I was. I mean, the, the, the level of intelligence in most of our crime is not very high. Yeah. Uh, so I had to go to court, and Paul, uh, subjected me to a vigorous cross-examination on the topic of whose checkbook this was and whether that was my signature. Uh, and he said, uh, can you give him some help? And I had had a difficult situation with the existing district attorney and I was delighted to give him some help. So I ran his campaign, mm. which started out as a primary uh, for the Republican nomination against the incumbent. Uh, and we won the primary, and then we went into the general election, and we won, and that was a four-way race, because the incumbent had the endorsement on the conservative line, and there were, and Bruce Carpenter was running on, and who was another marvelous character yes. uh, and a perennial figure in the area of criminal law was running on one of the third or fourth party lines uh, and then and then there was a democrat who was endorsed and we wound up winning the general election as well in fact we led the ticket um, and as the Consequence of that, I went into the district attorney's uh, office okay. as first assistant mm -hmm. for the south end of the county. Uh, and it, Paul and we had briefly um, a kind of uh, bombshell lineup there in the DA's office. Uh, we had Neil Robinson and John Ward trying misdemeanors in local court. <laughs> they're, they're, they're at the bottom of the batting order, if you can imagine that. Wow. Uh, we, Bill Arison, by that time, had become ill. Mm -hmm. And he was no longer uh, practicing. And I, I think we, we had, I mean, if it was a tennis team or whatever, I mean, we just had the, the, some of the best trial lawyers that were doing criminal work in the county. Starting with Paul King at the top and, and uh, Bill Foley, yeah. who was the long uh, Judge Foley's father. Bill was an outstanding criminal prosecutor, just, just brutal. I, when I was defending, I tried cases against him a couple of times and uh, he, he was very good, very good. So I was maybe number three in that lineup. And for a while, we pretty much had things our own way. Okay. Then Bill ultimately he passes away, Bill Harrison, and... Who well, it, but Paul King died first. Oh, that's right. Oh, what, that accident with the kind of lawnmower type thing? Uh, piece of farm equipment, kind of a bulldozer. Ah. Terrible, terrible accident. Just, I mean, you can't imagine how bad it was. Ah. Just awful. Uh, I had just gone into partnership with Doug Spoto and Mickey Donovan. Mm -hmm. uh, and we were just assembling our offices over in the uh, Hotel Jamestown building when that occurred. So John runs for DA. Uh, he's, he, uh, they appointed uh, 
somebody else as an interim district attorney and there was an election, John ran for DA and the public defender's office came open and I was offered it a couple of times. The first time I turned it down and then I decided maybe I'd like to run my own office. Mm -hmm. And I never was, my commitment in the DA's office was primarily to Paul. I never was 100% happy sending people to jail. It just bothered me. And I knew we were right and I, know, I never sent anybody there that I didn't think was guilty, but it just, wasn't the lane that I was meant to be in. Mm -hmm. So I uh, went over to the, that office and that created some problems because I'd been in the DA's office. Uh, John then hired Ron Gibb, who had been in the public defender's office to fill the assistant job. Mm -hmm. And that led to some problems down the road. Conflicts. Some conflicts. Yeah. Everybody thought that the conflict was going to be with me. And it turned out that the conflict was with Ron Gibb. Mm -hmm. the, when, when the Court of Appeals took a look at it, they said, no, it's fine for you to go from prosecution to defense, but you can't go the other way. Mm -hmm. So there were some cases that got reversed because of that. Well, it was a Sawyer case. Sawyer. 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 The big one was Sawyer. When I went over to the public defender's office, Lee Town Adams issued a ruling. Said, There's what he called a Chinese wall. Richard cannot touch any case that was in the DA's office when he left. You, were, you can only handle new cases. And I went, Ron and I switched day for day. So we had no, no time when we weren't employed in one office or the other. Our last days were the December, 31st of December. Our first day was the 1st of January. Mm -hmm. um, so for about six months or so, I did not have any case ready to go to trial. I took the first cases that came in, uh, but you had to wait for them to mature. And meanwhile, the cases that were coming along were tried by uh, the first assistants in the office. Uh, and of course, John took over as DA and uh, he started trying cases right away. Yeah, it was a Sawyer case which uh, got reversed, a new trial. And is that when Dobby Burgett was appointed? Yes, they, they just, uh, they, there was a lot that went on with the Sawyer case. Uh, the, the, the Ed Fagan was the public defender. He had a, a apparently a, a relationship of trust with Sawyer. Sawyer claimed that Eddie was the only lawyer he wanted. And he wanted the court to appoint Ed as his attorney. One of the things that you did not do was tell Lee Town Adams what to do. Uh, if you wanted Lee Town to do something, you might want to suggest that that's what you didn't want. But at the, at a very minimum, you never pushed for it. So Lee got his back up and said, absolutely not, I'm appointing the public defender, or and you can have him or you can have nobody. And I guess he wound up with nobody. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't take Bruce Carpenter. Uh, who was a very experienced attorney. Uh, and he tried it himself, and it got reversed. Uh, but it got reversed because of uh, the fact that Ron went from the public defender's office to the DA's office. Mm -hmm. And even though, uh, doubtless, Ron never revealed anything of a confidential nature, the appearance of it was too much for the Court of Appeals. So they, they reversed it. Uh, when I came into the public defender's office, uh, Bill Arison, Bill actually revived. Right. He, he went through a period of remission and for about, I guess maybe a year, he came back to trying cases. I actually tried two cases against him. 
uh, about a year into my tenure as public defender. But then it was temporary. So when I came into the office, uh, I went to see Bill at his house, and he was very concerned with the appeal for Susan Hallett. I don't know if you know about that case, but that, that was the biggest case that had hit Chautauqua County in many, many years. It was an enormous trial of, of, of all sorts of twists and turns in it. Uh, and uh, again, there was a strong issue of conflict. Because in that case, uh, Judge Adams had appointed two lawyers from the Public Defender's Office to represent two of the three defendants. And one of the defendants turned state's evidence. Sure. Uh, well, that was a real problem. And Bill had not been able to finish the appeal, and he was very worried about it, and it, we talked about it, and he gave me his notes, and. I told him I'd get it done, and, and I did. And uh, So I took it up to the appellate division, who did not reverse it. Uh, there was a dissent, but they didn't reverse it. And then John Ward and I went up to the Court of Appeals and argued for, uh, uh, for the Court of Appeals to accept it. And we appeared in front of Jason. And I, I remember sitting there, and Jason looked at, it had the, the file in front of him, and he'd read it. And he turned to John and said, John, how can you defend this? Isn't this an irrevocable conflict? Susan Hallett decided she wanted to hire a private attorney to pursue the appeal to the Court of Appeals, and I believe that the appeal was never perfected. Mm -hmm. Never got up to the Court of Appeals. Uh, and I think if it had, it would have been reversed. Yeah. But uh, there was some additional evidence floating around that hadn't made it to the trial uh, that probably would have resulted in the same if it, if it had come back for retrial. Right. Probably would have been the same. I generally spent about twice as much time immediately before the start of the trial mm. as the trial itself in the direct immediate preparation. Mm -hmm. And I have to say that from the beginning of that period to the end of the trial, mm -hmm. I, I just wasn't fit to live with. <laughs> I, I, it just, I had a, a lovely secretary who, I mean, I really was very fond of. She was married to my uh, investigator. And I think she, when I was at that point, she was actually afraid to come in the office. Because <laughs> I, I, I mean, I was just in this zone where there's, I, I can remember one time, um, a captain of detectives, mm -hmm. who was a, a friend, was up in court and I was getting ready to, the court hadn't started yet and I was in the room laying things out and doing this and doing that. And either Frank Bajano, my first assistant, or Brian Taylor, uh, uh, my other investigator, who later became chief investigator, came out to me and I barked something at him. And Larry said, don't you, aren't you aware of anything else that's going on besides this trial? And I said, when, when I'm trying a case, that's all there is. Yeah. There's nothing else. Yeah. Um, and it was true. And I, I, those were 16 hour days, 18 hour days. There were times I would go up to Mayville at six in the morning spend four hours or three and a half hours before court started, um, stay a couple hours afterwards. Yeah. It, I mean, it's just, it's a, I would lose seven, eight pounds over the course of a trial. 
and I didn't have a lot to lose. I mean, I'd, I'd go in at 155 and come out at 147. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I, it's just a, you know, it, for me at least, it, it was just a complete focus. Yeah. Um, and sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. So you were involved in, uh, as the, the public defender for a long period of time? I was there a total of 20 years. I was out for a little more than two. It was a, it was a appointment of the legislature. And I was appointed by a Republican majority. Uh, there was a period from uh, 1980 to, I think, early 1983. Late, somewhere in 1980 to some point in 83 when I was out. Uh, and then I came back and stayed there until, what, 2001? How did it work? So there, um, uh, felony uh, charge, it goes before Judge Adams. Uh, who actually appoints you to a case? Does it really come through Adams? No, the original appointments were almost always made by the local court. Oh, okay. And they would refer the matter, well, in a sense, we almost appointed ourselves. Mm -hmm. All of the cases that uh, where uh, individuals said, I don't have enough money, I need a lawyer appointed, were referred to the public defender's office. Once the request was made, it was referred to our office, and we would conduct, first of all, a financial inquiry to make sure they qualified, and uh, virtually everyone did. I mean, the costs of, uh, of the defense were pretty stiff. We would accept the case if it was a single defendant, or we would take what appeared to be the most serious case if there were multiple defendants. And then we would uh, refer the rest to other counsel. And those referrals basically would be approved by a city court judge or the town, uh, uh, the town justice. Mm -hmm. And then it would, uh, if there was an indictment or you waived indictment and came before Judge Adams or Judge Ward, Generally, they would confirm the appointment. Now, it's possible that Judge Adams might decide to do something different once in a while, but generally, there was a pool of lawyers who would accept these cases and who had some ability. There wasn't enough high-level criminal work to keep anybody busy. I don't think there was ever anyone in Chautauqua County who solely practiced criminal law unless they were in the public defender's office. So the place you got experience was in the DA's office or the public defender's office. Uh, and the guys like uh, my partners, Douglas and, and Mickey, who didn't have those jobs, never really got um, to be very expert in criminal law. So. Then you get the case. Uh how did it normally vet itself out? We'd get the file. I spent a lot of time in Mayville. I, I, I spent more time in the public defender's office in Mayville than I did down here in private practice. Mm -hmm. I was there generally all or parts of four days a week. It would, I usually spent one full day in Jamestown doing private stuff and <coughs> maybe two half days. Um, so I'd see the file pretty soon, pretty quickly. We'd get it, uh, the investigator would take a statement from the, uh, the defendant. We had uh, a woman named Bobby Trimmer, Barbara Trimmer, yeah. who was our uh, financial person. She'd run the numbers on the eligibility and also uh, do an evaluation for bail. Try to figure out a way to put together some package of uh, 
uh, recognizance and bail and property bond to get the person out of jail. And that was always the number one pri uh, priority, was getting the defendant out because if they couldn't make bail, they're going to sit in jail on a felony probably six or eight months before they get to trial. Um, that's a great benefit to the DA because the motivation to plead guilty is pretty strong. If the DA is offering you a year in county jail and you're going to do eight months anyway, uh, he may be able to avoid a trial. Sure. Uh, if you can get the defendant out and they can avoid being arrested again, which is always a risk, uh, you can do better sometimes if, you're, if it's the kind of case you're trying to plea bargain. Mm -hmm. Now if it's the kind of case you're, trying to, you're going to try um, and you've got a different set of concerns. A lot of cases are, are fairly clear. Before we had the insurgence of drugs, the most common felony scenario was two 17-year-old boys get drunk, start daring each other to do something, and wind up burglarizing a empty or closed business establishment. Mm -hmm. They're eligible as youthful offenders. They're not really bad, they're stupid, and they're caught immediately. Yeah. They generally confess within 20 minutes. Um, when I was in the DA's office, we decided what we would do with those cases is put the boy in jail for about two weeks and then let him out on probation. Over the years, that two weeks started to grow and grow and grow, and our theory was you, you want them back in school. Scare them and, and get them back in school. But the urge to uh, not give people a slap on the wrist kind of over five, ten years got it to the point where these same case maybe was resulting in six months in jail, mm -hmm. maybe a year in jail. Uh, so, but that's the kind of case that you know you're going to have to settle. There's there's nothing to it. It's it's very clear. You don't have any issues. You don't have any real hope. But you have a situation where you just should not be bringing a hammer down on this person. So. The other cases, of course, are, I mean, we would get two, sometimes three homicides, mm -hmm. intentional, apparently intentional homicide cases a year. Uh, and for a while, all of those got tried. It just, they just, there was no settling those. They just went to trial and that was that. And in between those, you have the armed robberies and the house burglary. And then we began to see the drugs. Yeah. And that just became a kind of tidal wave. Right. The, worst, the worst one that ever happened to me um, is a case John Ward and I tried. And this wasn't really very funny. Uh, I, the defendant was charged with two counts of sexual assault, class B felony. Uh, he was about 50 years old, something right around there. There was a question as to whether he was a predicate felon or not. Looked as if he might have been. He had a felony conviction in Ohio. There are time limits on this and you had to calculate the time and we weren't quite sure how that was going to come out. But he was potentially looking at maybe the rest of his life in jail. And the victim was a young woman, 19, I think. Mm -hmm. The defendant claimed that this was consensual, but the circumstances were, they made it look pretty bad. Uh, 
we weren't able to resolve the case. John's position on it was pretty firm. Uh, and we went to trial. And things started to go our way. Every now and then you get a case where all the breaks go your way. They, they don't necessarily mean you're going to win. I mean, sometimes they're in the end uh, irrelevant, but things went pretty well. And I was doing a fairly good job. Um, the examination of the young woman went very well. And uh, John began to rethink his position. And after the close of the people's case, we had a conference in front of Judge Adams. And John came down considerably. And I think he finally made an offer of five years in the penitentiary on a maybe a Class D felony mm -hmm. and no predicate, which means the minimums are cut back. So the defendant was looking at probably being in jail two years, maybe two and a half as opposed to possibly 15 to 30. Mm -hmm. So I went back and talked to him and he agreed to take it. And he entered a plea and we put it on the record. And Judge Adams called the jury back. And he was very concerned that this jury was going to be upset that the defendant had been allowed to enter a plea uh, and wasn't going to get his just desserts, and, uh, and this would look bad for the judge and look bad for the district attorney. So he made a little speech to the jury, and assured them that this defendant was going to go to the state penitentiary. Didn't tell them how long. And then he discharged the jury, and the foreman stood up and said, can I ask a question? Did Mr. Slater agree to this? And Judge Adams said, of course he did. Why do you ask? And he said, because we don't think he's guilty. <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> so, the timing for me was, was, I always thought that was a timing case. I had, early in my career, been very fortunate in trying cases. I ran up a string from beginning to a certain point where I didn't lose. Uh, and then John and I tried a murder case, which John won. It was the first case, I, first felony I ever lost. Up till then, I thought I was bulletproof. This was the case I tried immediately after that. So at this point, I'm less likely to be hardness. I think if I tried this one before he beat me on the murder case, I might not have taken the deal, right, right. just because I didn't think anybody could ever beat me. And I had now become humble. <laughs> and I was, that was the wrong moment to be humble. Yeah. But I can tell you that the conversation I had with my client over in the jail was extremely awkward. Oh my God, yeah. um, before I had that conversation, I sat down with the jury. I used to do this if I could. If jurors would talk to me, I would talk to them. And I had the whole jury in the jury room, and we were there for about an hour and a half talking about the case, and I was explaining to them why it seemed like a good idea to take this deal. And of course, the most important point is we don't know what you're going to do. Um, but that was probably the most shocking thing. I've ever had happen. Uh, but I think if something can happen, it does happen. I mean, the, the things that occur, there is a legend, and I don't know if this is true, that this is the story that I have heard several different places about the Hallett case, which I only handled the appeal on. And I talked to some of the jurors at the time I was doing the appeal. Uh, and it may very well be true. Uh, the, there were three defendants in that case, two men and the daughter of the victims, the daughter of the, the 
man and his, his her stepmother and her half sister were the victims. The her boyfriend who was one of the defendants was acquitted of murder and convicted of manslaughter. The story is that the juror, the chair, the uh, jury foreman was asked was uh, the, the question, how do you find on the charge of uh, intentional murder? And they, he said not guilty, and they did this three times for three different victims. And then they were, he was asked, how do you find on the lesser included charge of manslaughter in the first degree? And he said guilty. And there was a, just a, a chaos in the courtroom because nobody expected this. Mm -hmm. it was, it, the story is that the uh, commissioner, the clerk, forgot to ask how they found on the charge of felony murder, murder committed in the course of a burglary. Mm -hmm. And the jury was going to convict him on that. They were never asked. Dismissed, and he served a maximum sentence that they could give him, which I think was 30 years. No, I, 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 I'm sorry. I think the maximum sentence they could give him was 20, was, yes, 30 years was the maximum he could get, mm -hmm. instead of life. Because they failed to ask the question. That's the story. I, as I say, I'm not sure it's true, but I've heard it from a number of places. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, one of the jurors told me that. Yeah. that so, yeah, they're, they're, John and I once tried a case, we, we, I, I always thought of it as a practice case. We had a, there was a, a man who apparently was disturbed, uh, lived up in the Syracuse area, gets up in the morning and shoots his father. The father was probably my age, what I am now, the man was in his 50s. Took the family car and drove down the throughway to Buffalo, gets off the throughway there and holds up a restaurant or something. Steals money, gets back in the car and starts heading west and by this time the state troopers had put up a roadblock somewhere around Silver Creek in Chautauqua County. He drives the car off the road, starts going across a field, and the sheriffs and the state police follow him across the field. Eventually they apprehend him. Uh, he is convicted of murder in Onondaga County and sentenced to life convicted of armed robbery in Erie County and gets another sentence on top of that. So we pretty much used up all his life. He comes down here sitting in jail. He has been examined by psychiatrists in both jurisdictions. I have him examined, uh, I think by Mike Lynch out of Buffalo, who says, well, he's got a mental problem, but he understands the nature and consequences of his act and he knows they're wrong. Uh, he's not qualified for the not responsible plea. John says, look, I'll let him plead to a class D felony. He's charged with attempted murder of police officers in the course of their duty because he fired the gun at him two or three times while they were pursuing him across this field. So he can plead to a class D felony and I'll run the sentence concurrently with the 75 years or so he's got on everything else and we'll go home. Well, he said, no, I'm not going to do that. I guess he liked the food here. Yeah. So we spent a week and a half trying a case with eight or ten police officers and whatnot. The defendant spent the whole trial with his head down on the table. Never lifted his head up. Just sat there beside me 
sleeping, his head on the council table. We got, and, and he wouldn't talk to me. Wouldn't talk to me in jail, wouldn't talk to me in the courtroom. No idea what, just no communication at all. We, John rested and uh, Judge Adams said, uh, are you the defendant going to testify? I said, I don't know, Judge. Are you going to testify? Picks up his head and says, when you people get serious, then I'll talk to you. Put his head back down on the table. <laughs> The only time I was ever afraid uh, was with a, a, a man who I think just wasn't fully in control of himself. And I can't remember his name, but John Ward would remember him because John had trouble with this guy too. Uh, I think his first name was Jerry and he lived up around Stowe. And at some point in time he went after John Ward. but. When I was representing him, he was charged with some problem involving a woman who had once been his girlfriend. A big guy, very strong, uh, terrific athletic type build. And he did not like being in jail. He didn't, he was claustrophobic, outdoorsman, fisherman, hunter. And he started to get worked up in the jail cell. We're sitting in the jail cell talking, and he's telling me how he can't stand these walls and the, the, the setting, and he just kept getting more and more upset. And he stands up and grabs me by the shoulders and say, starts saying, you've got to get me out of here, you've got to get me out of here, you've got to get me out of here, and he's shaking me. and I. You know, this guy could break something without meaning to. He doesn't want to hurt me. He's not mad at me, yeah. but he doesn't understand what he's doing, and he he's just uh, uh, powerful as as you can imagine. And finally, he calmed calm down. But that was the only time I really got upset. Yeah. Um, and you sent Neil in for all the other ones? What's that? Then you sent somebody else in for the other no, ones? No, no. Oh, no, no. You, you, you know, you have to go and talk to sure. these people. I, I mean, this was one of the things I, I Bill Harrison told me this, and, and he's absolutely right. When an attorney is appointed by the court, or they're the public defender, and they are given to the defendant, the defendant didn't pick them, and they come from the judge in a sense. They don't know who you are, or they may not know who you are. They, you're, you're being pushed onto them by the very people who are trying to put them in jail. And you need to deal with that. And I've seen a lot of attorneys who are assigned to cases, and the first time they meet the defendant is when they go to the preliminary hearing in court. And they haven't and I think that's a mistake. I would go over first day, as soon as I got the files, if, once I'd read the file, uh, spent a little time with the uh, pattern jury of instruction, which is a, I don't know if they still use that book, but that was a great resource for, for both black letter law and case law. And, and so you get some understanding of the facts and the law, you go over to the jail, sit down with a person, tell them who you are. Now I, I got lucky after a while because after I'd been in the job about 10 years, people started to know who I was. And people in the next cell maybe had me as a, sometimes this is the third time I've represented the person. Uh, but go in, tell them who you are, tell them what you've done, tell them what you think of the case. Down the road, when you get to the point where you may have to sit down with the person and say, look, uh, there's a lot of evidence here and I think it's better for you to enter a plea of guilty and take this proposal than go to trial, then they're going to be more inclined to pay attention. Uh, if you're just somebody that breezes in and breezes out, um, it's going to be harder. 
and, and they're not going to get the representation they need. So. You had a lot of assistant public defenders over this period of time. Name names. People that worked for me? Yeah. Well, when I started, uh, Lynn Hartley was my one of my first assistants. Uh, and Bruce Carpenter was there, and he had been there through a series of public defenders. Uh, and Bruce was another, I, I don't know if people have talked about Bruce. Yeah, absolutely. Bruce was a, a I believe, a Phi Beta Kappa graduate of Brown University, mm -hmm. where he studied what was called greats, something they don't even teach anymore. But it involved Greek and philosophy, the great subjects, and also a near Olympic uh, rower, single skulls rower, oh, competed that. against uh, Grace Kelly's brother, Jack Kelly, yeah, who was yeah. an Olympian, ex-Marine, used to uh, train in single skulls on the Yalu River, mm. big as a house, yep. uh, and uh, a brilliant book lawyer, not the most practical person in the world. And he would sometimes get headed in the wrong direction, um, get fall in love with some aspect of the case and maybe lose a little perspective. Um, but one of the most interesting people you'd ever meet. He used to go over to Judge Adam's office and the two of them would read Greek together and argue about uh, Tacitus or Seneca or something like that sort of thing. Um, the Bob Van Every, mm -hmm. I hired Bob Van Every fairly early. Paul uh, Andrews was there when I got there. Mm -hmm. He was, uh, I think they called him an investigator, but he was really a paralegal. Uh, and, uh, and then, of course, Paul decided to go to law school, and uh, I wrote one of his letters of recommendation. I had expected that when he got out of law school, he would come back to our office, uh, but he disappointed me. I went over to the DA. The dark side. The dark side, yeah. But I got a chance to beat him a few times, and that helped. Okay. <laughs> um, Paul, uh, Paul beat me in a case, uh, you talk about funny things. I had a, a client who was charged with a smashing grab burglary at uh, the President's Jewelry Store. Mm. Window was broken, item taken, and my client's fingerprints were found on uh, something in the area where the, the items were taken. He wasn't seen there. Uh, I forget, there was a little bit of circumstantial evidence that went beyond that. But it looked like a pretty good case, uh, except for these fingerprints. But it turned out that he had been in the store a couple days earlier and had looked at some items. And um, just President's brother, I can't remember. Bill. Bill, Bill President. Bill President. Yeah. Testified and, and conceded when he testified that uh, the guy had been there. Couldn't remember what he showed him. Couldn't remember if he'd picked up the case, I think it was a watch case, that had the fingerprints on it or not, but he might have. So this case looking very, very good. Uh, and I put my client on the stand. And Neil Robinson, we, we were there very late, the case was, Lee Town was determined to get this case done with, and we ran right up to about five o'clock. Neil Robinson came in and sat in the back to watch the end of the case, and Paul is waiting to cross-examine my client, who testifies to going in the store and looking around. And Paul gets up, and I guess he thought, well, what do I do now? And he goes over to my client and says, 
Mr. Defendant, uh, when you were in the store, and he holds up the watch case, did you touch this watch case? And Neil told me afterwards that he thought, oh my God, Paul, you've just broken the cardinal rule. Never ask a question if you don't know the answer. You've set this guy up to, to tell you how he touched the watch case, and it's a terrible blunder. And the client looks at him and says, Oh no, Mr. Andrews, I never touched that watch case. <laughs> <laughs> the jury was out about 10 minutes and came back with a conviction. <laughs> One time, I was at a seminar uh, when a, a very famous attorney said, if the ship's sinking, fire all the torpedoes. And, and that, and, you know, that's just good advice. If you're, Paul really had nothing to lose, <laughs> and it worked out. You know, and that, I mean, that's the kind of thing that just happens in these cases. I, I guess, truth be told, I guess probably my client was guilty. Yeah. I mean, I don't know that he was guilty. He never told me he was guilty. Yeah. Um, but uh, I guess he probably was. In the, we didn't get to this, but in the chronology of your law practice, you're by yourself at the Fenton building, and then we kind of skipped to the fact that all of a sudden you joined with Doug and Walt. Was there anything in between, or did you kind of go from solo practitioner to that group? Yeah, I was working, and I, I had a part-time job in the DA's office as first assistant. Walter, uh, Mickey Donovan, and I were good friends. And Doug and I were uh, uh, very congenial attorneys. We weren't as close, but Walter was close friends with, with Doug. Mm -hmm. He was kind of a linchpin. I knew Doug. I mean, we, we'd done a lot of things together as lawyers, and we got along very well. And uh, somehow, we just got into a conversation about how maybe we ought to start a law firm together. I can't remember what Walter was doing at the time. I, I don't know if he was uh, working for the bank or if he, I think he had a private practice. I think he was by himself. Mm -hmm. uh, Doug was with his dad and his dad was getting older, really in semi-retirement and not going to do uh, very much anymore, going to go south in the winter. and. Uh, and it just worked out, and we began talking about it, and it seemed like a good idea. And I mean, we really thought, we get together, we can, we can create something pretty good here. Mm -hmm. And uh, Walter and Doug had been well, very good law students, and were very good attorneys, extremely knowledgeable. Uh, Walter had as much ability as any lawyer I've ever known. Mm -hmm. He'd just do anything. Doug uh, was outstanding. Both of them, I think they both graduated first in their class at law school. Mm -hmm. I know Doug did, and I know that Mickey was um, editor of the Law Review. So he had to be, if he wasn't first, he was second. Right. Uh, but unfortunately, Walter had problems with alcohol, mm -hmm. and that sort of held us back. But things happen. Yeah. Was, was tell me about Ross Photo. He, I know he was somewhat retired at the time, but did your paths cross with him? Much? Oh yes, Ross. Well, Ross was a great gentleman, yeah. and um, I had very little to do with Ross when I was practicing. He just. We just didn't move in the same. Ross, uh, principal field of expertise was bankruptcy law. Mm -hmm. He was, I think, the number one bankruptcy lawyer in Chautauqua County. I didn't do any of that. Uh, and real estate and business law. A lot of clients with grocery stores and other kinds of businesses, bars and so forth. And those were areas that I didn't get into very much. Uh, Doug was doing uh, the family court work, 
and the divorce work, and so we bumped into each other frequently uh, in that area. And Doug had uh, occasionally a criminal case. Hmm. Hey, Doug will tell you the, the and I'll let Doug tell you the story about the criminal case we had against each other. Okay. Where we were, I was in the DA's office and he was assigned. Uh, but he can, he, he can tell that story. Um, now, did your path, I know your paths probably crossed uh, at the time, with, but uh, in, the, in the criminal bar, really Mike Lombardo was the icon. And did you actually, I know he was around, I would see him, me even, at city court occasionally, but was, did you have any, any real inter interactions with Mike? Only to talk to him okay. and watch him. Yeah. I never had a case with him. And to be honest, I don't remember Mike trying any case. That I remember him making motions in court. Uh, he slipped out of practice very quickly after uh, very early in the 70s. It, 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 I don't know what Dalton told you about this, but there was a point at which he was involved in a trial and Dalton had to take it over. Mm. Uh, he just, you know, had, I'm not sure how old he was, but I, he had to be at least as old as I am now. Yeah. The lawyer that I had a, a, a case with, the great lawyer that I had a case with was Willard. Okay. And he wasn't well. Mm -hmm. he, he was. Uh, he wasn't strong. Uh, I had a, it was a, a matrimonial uh, custody case. And we tried it for three or four days. And he, I had my best witness. Willard didn't do much the first couple of days. He really, I think, was resting. Mm -hmm. And I put my best witness on the stand, and Willard got up for about three hours. And I never in my life saw a cross-examination like that. Mm -hmm. I, never. I've seen lawyers in Buffalo, New York City, and famous names. I never saw anybody do what he did. Um, he, I, he was the best lawyer I ever saw in the courtroom. Right. Now, I never saw Mike. I don't know what he was like. I know, you know what the New York papers reported and so forth. Everybody knows that. Uh, I met Mike before I came here. We referred cases to his firm uh, from Kemper. They, uh, his firm did the Kemper work down here. And I was coming back from lunch with uh, Frank Vallone, the lawyer that uh, was my boss. And I looked across, the, he said, look across the street. And there were two fellows over there, about six foot three, and then this other little guy. And he said, I want to take you across the street and introduce you to the best lawyer in New York State. Mm -hmm. You know, the two lawyers across the street were Dan Roach and John Madden, mm -hmm. and both about six three. And Mike Lombardo, I, if he was five five, it was a lot. Mm -hmm. And he looked like he ought to be. I don't know what. I mean, he, he was the most commonplace-looking guy in the world, and I couldn't believe it, it when he introduced me to him. But uh, I can't tell you how many times I've sat in uh, old chambers outside Roland Fancher's court mm -hmm. when Mike was going to go in and listen to Mike dispense wisdom, mm -hmm. and that's the only way I can describe it. I, yeah. He just would tell you how the world worked and how juries worked and witnesses worked and uh, if you paid attention and you could follow his thought patterns, I mean, put them into action, you, you turn into a pretty good lawyer. Yeah. Uh, but I never did get to see him actually try a case. You, you've been great, Richard. This is fabulous. I've taken more of your time than I bet you thought it was going to happen today. But as you came in today, drove in to the uh, Philip Slidle, uh, was there any questions you were thinking that Greg was going to ask you, or did you no. know anything? <laughs> no. 
<laughs> I, I was just hoping I could remember everybody's name. Yeah, fabulous, fabulous job. As, as you reflect back now, I mean, here you are, you're now in retirement, but a chance to probably reflect on a career, and certainly a career which is so well known in the public sector, uh, with certainly the public defender's office at a time with the district attorney's office and litigation. Is, is there a kind of a guide you would give to somebody if I were a young 30-year-old looking to do this? So you say, based on my experience, here's what I'd like you to consider. Guidance. Boy. Wisdom. I don't know. Um, th there's no substitute for work. Mm -hmm. I mean, and they're, they're, early on I had a, a very big case. Uh, too big for me. I, I was really too young for it. Uh, a fellow hired me. Was, was actually getting paid for it. Uh, and I, I spent, I knew it was big, and I spent all my time getting ready for it. And I kept investigating things and looking for some way into the case. And one avenue after another just turned out to be a, a dead end. And finally, on the 99th thing we attempted, paid off. Uh, and it just taught me right at the beginning, just keep going. Don't stop. Don't give up. Uh, sooner or later, if you work hard, you probably find your way into it. Mm -hmm. Uh, I talked about Mike Lombardo, and I can remember Mike saying, when you find the weakness in the case, go right to it. Don't fiddle around with something else. You find it and then go to that spot. Uh, you, you look for the anomaly. Uh, now I don't know how that plays out if you're a corporate lawyer or a real estate lawyer, but if you're, when you're defense lawyer, particularly when you're a public defender, you, you, you're given this file. That, that's it. You, you get what you get. And uh, you, can't, you can't create it. You have to work with what you have. Uh, you just have to, you, and if you work hard enough, eventually, <laughs> number one, you'll learn how to do things reasonably well. Some people have talent and some people don't, but everybody can work. Yeah. This is great. You've been fabulous, Richard.